Greetings and salutations. I hope this video finds you well. This video is right off the top of my head. I had absolutely no intention whatsoever of doing a video today at all. I have prepared nothing for you to see other than this slide and this slide. And this is the slide I usually show at the end of videos. But this time around, I'm just going to talk and I'm going to leave this particular slide up on the screen. So if you are one of those who likes to listen to videos while you do other things, be my guest. This one is made for you. I'm doing this video because I had a dream this morning. And I can't get it out of my head. You know how that last dream that you have just before you wake up for the day, sometimes you just think about it all day long. And in that dream, I was playing around with AM stereo. And... I have been thinking about that all day, and it struck me that there are some parallels between the story of AM stereo and the story of the Linux desktop. And maybe this might do somebody some good if I point them out. Also, the last video I did where I was talking about the turntable, some folks said that they wanted to hear some radio stories. So here you go, right? You're getting a two-for-one deal here. For those of you who are totally new to my channel, I will take just a moment and explain to you that I worked in radio for a very long time. I started hanging out in radio stations in the mid-80s. I went to school for radio. I started out studying engineering, which is my first love, which is recording and radio engineering. And then I decided that I wanted to be an announcer because I thought that was cool. And I also figured out that I wasn't very comfortable sticking my hand inside a radio transmitter that had 50,000 volts going through it. It just, no, that's not for me. Well, I became an announcer and an assistant engineer off and on. And then I worked my way up into management and became a program director and operations manager until I was... Bounced out of the business in 2007, and I have not been back. They fired me in 2007, those bastards, and you know who you are. And I have never set foot in another radio station since then, and there you go. <laughs> That's my radio career in a nutshell. When I was first starting out in radio, when I had decided that I wanted to be a radio person, I was a teenager in the 80s, and... The biggest technology in radio at that particular point in time was this thing called AM stereo. So what is stereo? Well, stereo is two-channel audio. That means you got audio for your left ear and audio for your right ear. Now, to understand the history of stereo, you got to go all the way back to the 30s when Bell Telephone Laboratories was playing around with the idea, and that was in the early 30s. But the technology wasn't quite there yet. And then Hollywood latched on to the idea in the late 40s with the advent of magnetic tape and magnetic recording. They actually started making movies in stereo. And then home audio enthusiasts wanted to get in on the game. So in the mid-50s, if you were really cool, you would have a stereo system in your house, which was extremely expensive. And the only way that you could get stereo material to listen to was to buy tapes, which they were expensive and the machines to play them. And we're not talking about little cassette tapes. We're talking about big open reel tape machines. And then this thing happened right around 1957, 58, where they figured out how to put stereo on records, LP records. And that was a big craze in the late 50s. Well, all the while, radio broadcasters were sitting around wondering, how can we broadcast stereo? And there had already been some fun experiments that were done in the late 50s where if a radio station happened to have an AM frequency and an FM frequency, that they'd put one channel on the AM and they'd put one channel on the FM. And the idea was is that people listening at home could have two different radios and then they could hear the stereo program. They were doing stuff like that. But in the late 50s, the people who were building radio transmitters and radios were working on this idea of 
putting stereo on the radio. And for FM stereo, they actually got to a place where a committee was formed with the Federal Communications Commission, which is the FCC. In the United States, the FCC is the government body that controls broadcasting. And when something new comes along, what they usually do is they form a committee to come up with standards. And then they publish those standards. And they say that anybody who is broadcasting, like a broadcaster who has a radio station and a transmitter, and those who build radios should all conform to a single standard. Well, way back in the 60s, they didn't really mess around with AM stereo at that point in time. It was easier to do FM. FM was the new hot thing. And since the late 40s, people had started getting interested in FM radio. And FM radio at that point in time was considered to be the medium for good music, like classical and jazz, and uh, an affluent audience would listen to that, a cultured audience. So they went with FM stereo first. And the way that happened was Zenith and RCA submitted their plans for an FM stereo system along with some other companies. And this committee, the FCC, had going. All these engineers looked at this, and they said, okay, gang, we really like some of what Zenith has done and some of what RCA has done, and we like that, and we're going to take a little bit from both. We're going to come up with a new standard. Voila, you have the FM multiplex stereo standard that is still in use today in the United States. So if you are able to get your hands on one of those really early Fisher tube type a FM stereo tuners from the early 60s, if you get a hold of one of those things, it will actually work on modern FM. And that standard was published in 1961. And what that meant was is that the radio stations and the radio manufacturers, the people who actually made radios and they made transmitters and they made all that stuff, they had something to work with. They had a standard. And FM stereo slowly caught on. It took about 15 years for FM stereo to get where it was really popular up until about nine, it started playing top 40 music on FM in stereo probably about 1971, 72. And by 1975, it was the hip and happening thing, right? So the AM broadcasters were sitting over here going, uh, we're still in mono. Can we have some stereo too? And so in the mid-70s, a push came along. There was a push in the radio world, engineers, whoever started the thing, that we should go ahead and refine AM stereo. And a lot of companies started working on it. Harris started working on it. A company called Hazeltine started working on it. Con Engineering started working on it. There was another company called Motorola. You may have heard of them if you're a computer geek but not a radio engineer who was working on an idea as well. And very similar to what they did with FM stereo, the FCC started a committee. They wanted to hear what everybody had to say. And the Federal Communications Commission once again kind of narrowed it down to two systems. And those two systems were CON, Hazeltine, ISB. The con people and the Hazeltine people kind of got together, and then they came up with this system called ISB. The other system was Motorola's CQAM system, and CQAM is an acronym for Compatible Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, while ISB is an acronym for Independent Sideband. And these were the two systems that it pretty much came down to, although there were some other companies that had put some equipment out there. Harris was one. Magnavox had a system. And the Federal Communications Commission essentially didn't make a decision at all. They just said, well, we can't choose between the two of them, so we're not going to do it, and we're going to let the marketplace decide. This was pretty much the worst thing that they could do. Now, 
the two big systems that the marketplace was really looking at at the time that this all went on, and this was the early 80s, were CON and CQAM. The CON ISB system was interesting in that you really didn't need to have a special radio to hear it. What you could do is go down to the five and dime and you could buy two cheap radios off the shelf and you could use those radios to hear stereo on AM. You would tune one radio just a little bit below the carrier frequency. So let's say if you were trying to listen to KFRC in San Francisco at 610, which was one of the first stations to run CON, then you could just you could tune down just a little bit like more towards 600 see and then you could take that same a uh, the other am radio and you could tune just above it and because each channel was broadcast on either side of that carrier now if that goes over your head sorry about that some of you guys out there will know what i'm talking about so con was really cool but then sequam had advantages as well it kind of worked out for a very short period of time when this technology was introduced and this was in the early 80s we're talking 83 84 right around in there that the west coast a lot of the stations out there went with the con system because hey that's where leonard Kahn's company was based and he kind of went around and sold it to him and on the east coast a lot of the stations went with sequam so some of the big radio stations that had this technology in place were WNBC in New York. They were an early adopter. Uh, also, uh, K uh, WLS in Chicago. They went to stereo at some point. In Los Angeles, it was KFI. Uh, KRLA was in stereo in the Los Angeles area. Also, KFRC in San Francisco. They were stereo. And so this little competition went on. The radio manufacturers didn't really know what to do. One company, Sony, that was really big on this idea of AM stereo, they actually came out with radios that had a switch on them where you could switch between the two systems. Now, from an engineering point of view, you must understand that building such a radio was a proposition that was going to cost money. It was an investment because if you're building a stereo radio where you would build a regular mono AM radio, you're doubling everything in the radio, right? Pretty much. So that's expensive. Then you have to license the decoder chips that will actually decode the stereo information off the AM signal. At least that's the case with Motorola because Motorola sold the chips. And if you wanted to have AM stereo in your radio, you needed to get one of these chips or you'd have to license the technology one of the two. So the radio manufacturers, they kind of drug their feet. They didn't really build AM stereo radios because they weren't sure which direction it was going to go. Meanwhile, the radio broadcasters that were thinking about going into stereo, if they didn't have a great deal of money, they didn't know where to put their money because it was a very expensive proposition to convert a, a mono AM radio station to stereo at that time. Usually that involved having to rebuild the studio entirely for stereo. And so if they were going to go stereo, they would have to figure out what system they were going to go to. So a lot of the lesser than affluent radio stations uh, didn't do it. They just didn't change at all. Just took a wait and see attitude. What happened then was is in the mid to late 80s the car manufacturers kind of got in on the deal because now they were going to put radios in cars that could de decode AM stereo. And there was a company called Visteon. I don't know if they're still in business today but what they did was is they built all the radios for Ford. It was a division of the Ford Motor Company. They started putting radios out that had stereo AM in them, and it was uh, Sequam. And the same went with GM. GM came out with a bunch of Delco radios. Uh, Delco was the company that made all the radios for GM cars, and they started coming out with Sequam. So now a lot of the stations that originally had gone with Quam 
or uh, Khan, rather. Quam. See, Quam. Eh. You try and say all this fast, man. Can't do it. Anyway, all the stations that originally had gone with Khan were now going to go with Sequam. And they had to go out and invest the money to change over that. Now, fortunately, once you already had the entire system, you know, from the studio to the transmitter to the antenna, all set up for stereo, switching from one to the other was just a matter of buying the exciter. So it was really that big a deal to switch from one system to the other. But the radio manufacturers had lost interest by the really late 90s. And they weren't building these radios. People didn't know the technology existed because it was not something that was automatically there. And the manufacturers who were building the radios had no demand, so they didn't do it. And that sort of kind of killed off music on AM radio. It really did. At that point in the early 90s, a lot of the broadcasters in the United States decided that they were going to convert their amplitude modulated radio stations from music to talk. And they did. And so even though uh, some work was going forward on improving Sequam AM stereo, the second generation came along. In the early 90s, we had this thing called the NRSC, which was the new radio standard committee that was put together by the FCC. Our friends at the FCC, yet again, uh, that made some other improvements to AM radio, came up with some standards uh, that broadcasters could go by. There just was not much interest in making stereo available on AM in the United States. AM stereo happened in the United States, Mexico, Canada, in Japan, and in Australia. It was not adopted in Europe. I'm not really sure, 100% uh, sure about that, but I have been told that people who watch videos that you mention AM stereo or whatever, uh, you may not know what I'm talking about because in Europe they just didn't roll this technology out. Now, believe it or not, AM stereo is still around. And much later on, we're talking up around the year 2000, I heard that the Federal Communications Commission had finally decided that they were going to uh, make the decision that the marketplace had figured out which one it was going to be. And they very quietly said that the standard for broadcasting stereo in the United States is... Sequam, Motorola had won the battle. Well, guess what, folks? Too little, too late. Uh, believe it or not, AM stereo is still around. A few companies still build the radios. Every once in a great while, I have heard about some new radio that came along that had the chip in it. And there are some stations in the United States that run AM stereo. Do not know about Australia, do not know about Japan, have no clue. But that is the story of AM Stereo. It was a very promising technology. My first job out of school was working for a radio station that was equipped with Sequam AM Stereo. And I remember walking into the studio the first time that I was ever there, and it was the first time that I'd ever heard AM Stereo before, because up to this point, I did not own a radio that could decode it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was unbelievable to me because most people associate AM radio with something that sounds bad or no high frequencies or lots of static. Uh-uh, this was not what I heard. AM stereo, when it is very well done, and you have a very good radio, sounds better than FM. It is more open, you have a wider stereo image, and it's just more natural to listen to. Even though AM stations generally can't broadcast much over 10,000 cycles in the United States, or 10,000 hertz, and it doesn't really make that much difference. AM still sounds better than FM, if you're running really good Sequam AM stereo. It's amazing. If you've ever heard this, you'd blow your mind. You'd just go crazy. But the problem was, and I worked for this station for 
I don't know, about three or four years. It was my first radio station, WTAR in Norfolk, by the way, on 790, for those of you who care about such things. It was very frustrating because you were sitting in the studio and you were, you were hearing this wonderful signal that we were putting out. And the studio itself was state-of-the-art for the day. It really sounded good. They hadn't scrimped on building the studios or anything like that. But yet, when you turned on the radio in most cars, it sounded like that. It was like, well, no wonder nobody wants to listen to this, you know? If you ask any engineer who was around in that period that worked on that technology, and I am one of them, what was the main reason that AM stereo did not catch on in the United States? It was because the Federal Communications Commission did not choose a standard. They could have chosen either one as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Con ISB, independent sideband, sounds really good. I've heard it. It's not illegal to run con, or at least it wasn't uh, as of a few years ago. Some people who do low-power AM radio stations were running con just for the hell of it and recording it. I heard, actually got to hear it in operation, and I've heard recordings of like KFRC in San Francisco when they were running con and KFI in Los Angeles. But the thing about it is they didn't choose, and the radio manufacturers didn't know which way to go and a lot of the smaller stations who would it would be a big deal for them to put that investment into it they didn't go with it so it just sort of died on the vine and i fear that kind of the same thing is going on in the linux world so now you're going okay well now he's done talking about the radio stuff maybe he'll actually talk about linux now what is the correlation here it's the lack of a standard Linux is more popular today than it has been ever on the desktop. There is actually a lot of interest in the Linux desktop. I have said this, I've heard other podcasters talking about this, and the problem is is that anybody who is outside of the Linux community who comes to Linux, they are so confused because there are no standards to go by. And the two biggest things that stand in the way of people jumping into Linux, creating software for Linux, building hardware for Linux. The two biggest things that stand in the way are the apparent lack of a standard when it comes to a desktop, and that word apparent is very important, and the lack of a standard when it comes to how software for Linux is packaged. We'll talk about the desktop first. We have all of these different desktops in Linux. Most recently, I was playing around with KDE Plasma. It's awesome, by the way. I was enjoying playing with it. And people from the outside who don't use Linux or understand how it works look at that and think that GNOME is an entirely different thing than KDE is an entirely different thing than XFCE or the Mate desktop or Mate, whatever you want to call it. Either way. What they don't know, because it takes a little while to figure this out, is that all Linux desktops are built to a standard, this free desktop standard that's out there. So if you are making software for a Linux machine and it's going to run on the desktop, it's going to run in the graphic user environment, then what you do is, is you look up where to put your launcher so the menu will find it. You know, when it's installed, you basically put a file in a certain place in the file system, and the next time the menu goes out to look for all of the little launchers that it shows, hey, there's the one for your software. And the other thing is you have to create a little icon for the application. You put that in the right place, and the system finds that, and they put them together, and bada bing, bada boom, it works. And it makes no difference whether you're on KDE or whether it's GNOME, or any desktop that is related to either GTK or QT. It makes no difference. But apparently, to people looking in from the outside, when they look at Linux Mint versus Ubuntu, for instance, or they look at Debian versus CentOS, even, if they're thinking about doing some sort of desktop application, they're different, and they look different, and they act different. And so that scares people off, even though there really is a standard there. 
as far as packages are concerned, there really is not a standard there. It doesn't exist. So what you have is we have in Ubuntu, we have apt, comes from Debian. But that doesn't mean that a package that's compiled for Debian will automatically run on Ubuntu or vice versa. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. If you've ever tried to get a deb package for Debian and install it on Ubuntu, every now and again you get one, you go, hey, it works. But if there's a difference in the dependencies, it may not work. Also, packages for different versions of Ubuntu and Debian may not work. So, for instance, a piece of software that was compiled for Ubuntu 14.04 may not work on 16.04. Or it may work on 16.04, but now it doesn't work on 18.04. So we're just talking about long-term support releases. See how confusing this gets from so, for somebody from the outside? Maybe you understand what I said. Maybe you don't. We have people who are trying to fix that problem, but still, we have snap packages. We have app images. We have flat packs. These are all independent package, package systems that are supposed to be distro agnostic, and it doesn't make any difference. However we still have more than one. So now which way do you go if you have a piece of software that you would like to offer to Linux? What if you have a piece of software which is proprietary and you try and offer it to Linux? A story that I heard not too long ago was that a company did have such a piece of software and when they tried to talk to people in the Linux community about it they were basically told well if it was open source then we'd be interested but we're not it's proprietary so go away why aren't you open sourcing it? And those people just didn't have any clue who to talk to. They ended up being in some sort of forum somewhere and people kind of blew them off like, we don't care because it's not open source, which opens up another can of beans. That's a whole different topic to talk about is that people get pushed away because some people, open source is great. I would prefer to use open source software. I have published open source software that I have written myself. But if there is a proprietary piece of software that solves a problem or makes the Linux world more attractive to more people, then I am all for that piece of software being packaged up to run on Linux. I'm good with that because it will bring more people to the platform I love Linux. I like how it works. I would like to see more people using it. But we have so much infighting in the community, so much fragmentation, that people who are coming in from the outside, people who would be writing software for the platform, investing in the platform, if they're not part of the Linux community, they are not a follower of Richard Stallman, and they're not in on this little club that we're all a part of, then they don't know where to go because there's no central place to talk to. I guess you could say the Linux Foundation would be. So uh, I'm just putting this out there. It's just my thoughts. I do not have any solutions. But the AM stereo system was just wonderful, and it was one of the things that I swear, if you've ever heard it, you just wouldn't believe it. And... AM radio has this advantage of being able to be heard for thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. So this is why there was all of the interest from the car manufacturers in these AM stereo radios, because there are parts of the United States, out in the western United States, where you can't hear FM. There are parts in Canada where you are so far away from a city center that there's not necessarily an FM station to hear. However, a 50,000 watt AM radio station can be heard for thousands of miles at night. And you can hear them in stereo. So you could be driving through the desert in the southwest of the United States and you could be listening to uh, WLS out of Chicago in stereo and hearing music in stereo. It, yeah, I kind of faded in and out every now and again, but it was still there. It was still cool. It was it was, it made it a very interesting listening experience. And the thing about Linux is those of us who are 
inside this little ball who have used it for a long time and have overcome all of the barriers the understanding and taking the time to actually sit down and learn it we know that this is a better system than what is commercially available out there and it is very frustrating just like back in the days when i was working in radio and sitting there and hearing that wonderful signal and knowing that people on the street couldn't hear it it is still it's the same way with linux man it's like i'm sitting here and i use this every day i've got a whole network full of these machines in my house in my house and everything runs on linux and it all talks to each other and my kids play games on their computer and all this other stuff and it's hard to get the word out because we're not talking about one thing. We're talking about this federated open technology with about 10,000 choices at every step and it makes it difficult. So until we get the companies out there that will uh, start to invest in Linux and we figure out some way to be more friendly to these people and educate them about the platform, it, it, we bring them in. You know, maybe it's just a matter of showing them how to make a snap package. Getting them hooked up with the right people that can take their software and put it in a snap package, which will run on any Linux distribution. The other day, I installed Minecraft for my son, and I used a snap package on Linux Mint 18.3 because the machine that he's using, it will not upgrade to either Linux Mint 19 or Ubuntu 18.04. There's a bug it's got a core duo processor in it but yet i was still able to get the latest minecraft with the new launcher by installing a snap package that those are steps in the right direction so maybe a lot of these different software people out there that we would like to see them package something for linux if they were taught how to do snaps and showed how to make one of a snap package then it would be super easy to do uh, i would like to work with somebody to create a snap package for my XBT program. If anybody out there knows how to do snaps and would like to uh, have a shot, take a shot at it and we could work together on that, I would love to hear from it because right now I'm distributing it as a bash script and it would be really nice to be able to put it into a package format that somebody could easily install and I could give them one command and it would install the thing and I wouldn't have to have the installer. So yeah, if anybody out there can do that, I'd love to hear from you. So anyway, gang, I, I don't have any more conclusions than that. It was just this thought that was going on inside of my head and I was thinking about those technologies and how there's just so much similarity. We have this wonderful Linux world and uh, it's hard to sell it to people. It's hard to show them and it's just because there's not a standard place to start and I don't I mean <laughs> it sounds weird to say this but it's like nobody's building the radios for the Linux desktop isn't that weird I think I've gone completely insane I have gone nuts these two things have merged in my brain they will never come apart I've gone absolutely completely crazy so there you go by the way, uh, the next Linux video that will be posted on this channel is going to come along when Linux Mint comes out with Linux Mint Debian Edition 3, which is codenamed Cindy. So I absolutely positively have to take a look at that. That will be the next Linux-related video that is posted here. So it is all up to the Linux Mint team. Unless I have more weird dreams and absolutely have to post my thoughts before then, that will be the next thing that we do. Your feedback, as usual, is always welcome. Please be sure to give Easy Linux a lice on, like on Facebook, too. Uh, that I said lice in there. Yeah, that's what I said. There's a joke in there somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Also, we have facebook.com slash easy Linux. That's it, right? No, check out easy Lin www easy linux.com. That's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah, that's the official webpage. And that's got some interesting information on there. And while you're at it, check out freedompenguin.com. Why? I don't know, because there's all kinds of really cool stuff happening on that that talks about Linux. So if you're a total Linux head and you need more Linux content, go there, because there's always interesting stuff. And it's run by Matt Hartley, who's kind of a nice guy, and I like to say nice things about Matt. And that's it. Thanks for watching.